we're in at the moment, there's, there's a lot of reassessing going on, isn't there? People are sort of evaluating what's, what's important to them, what's priority to them, you know, and, and, and maybe as a result, pe people are shuffling things around or, or starting new jobs or things like that, or just evaluating, actually, I need some more time to rest or things like that. And uh, I felt I want to share a message this morning of, of a similar vein, just going back to some essential truths, going back to what's important to us. And so what I want to do this morning is just actually encourage us and give us a fresh challenge, and that is to be a people ready to share the gospel. Be a people ready and equipped to share the good news about, about, Jesus, about Jesus, the Son of God. Because as we know, this is a life-giving message, isn't it? This isn't just a glib, you know, message on the side that you'll read in the paper or something. No, this is a, a life-giving message. And it's a message when we share it that uh, is full of power. Do we believe that this morning? When we share the gospel message, it is full of power. Well, if not, I want to encourage you this morning, and that's my goal before you walk out the door, that you feel refreshed in the truth of the gospel, all right? So what we're going to do is take a walk through Romans. We're going to have a look at a few verses in chapter 1, and then I want you to open uh, shortly to Romans 8, and we're going to go through Romans 8 together. Are we up for that? Everyone? Yeah? Enthusiastic? Ready? This is what it's all about. Now, all right, let's start in... Romans, 8, uh, Romans 1, verse 8. Uh, and we, we would remember as well that Romans is the Apostle Paul's fullest and most clearest explanation of what, um, what uh, the gospel message is, is, is all about, the unpacking of the gospel. So it's a good place to be. Uh, Paul says, uh, I thank uh, my God through Jesus for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. So Paul here is writing to a Christian community, probably not much bigger than uh, everyone in this room now, just a small gathering of Christians whose faith is being reported all over the world. Now, here's an interesting thought to kick us off. Are you ready? Paul shares his fullest, clearest explanation of the gospel to a bunch of Christians to a bunch of people who are already in the faith. And you know what? I get really encouraged and challenged by that. It's like as it's, it's if Paul is saying, hey, this is what we are all about. This is what we are all about. This is the foundational message that we've been entrusted with. Of course, I'm going to preach to you guys and share the gospel. Because, you know, it's like if we're going to be in partnership, says Paul, this is it. This is it. This is the core truth. So he preaches to other Christians. And I think actually at times, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to remind ourselves and stir ourselves of the truth that Jesus died for us and he loved us and his death and resurrection have achieved great things. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we don't exist as a church to put on cups of tea or even have nice fellowship or good kids work. Great as those things are, Primarily, we exist, we are set apart, says Paul in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, for the gospel, for the good news about Jesus. This is what we are entrusted with. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves and sometimes kind of shake the cobwebs out and remember what it's all about. Because we would admit, isn't there just so much to distract ourselves? I mean, uh, Julian's pre la preached last week. It was great. I mean, there's, there's so much in the numbers. There's so much to distract ourselves with. Just the volume of even good Christian content out there. It's like we need to put it aside for long enough to remember the core truth of what we are all about, about the gospel. Now, Romans 1 verse 16 says, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for... Because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed, says Paul. Now, here's the thing. If Paul didn't potentially have something to feel ashamed about in the gospel message, he wouldn't be defending himself that he wasn't ashamed of it. What do I mean by this? Well, let me use an illustration. Growing up, we had a number of vehicles as a family. You know, family, family wagons. The most memorable one for me and cringe-inducing one was one that was pretty much exactly like this. 
a bright yellow van. It had like old squeaky leather seats and I think it had curtains in the back and big beige stripes down the side. And honestly, growing up, this was, this was like, oh, even now I kind of get my left eye starts twitching. You know, it's like just embarrassing. I don't know if that says more about me as sort of like, you know, a young teenager, you know, and, and this is how sensitive you feel. But, but I'm going to say this was one of the most, I, I, I wonder, Adam's probably like, no, nah, bro, that thing's awesome. I mean, I'll take that. How much do you want for it, you know? No, no, don't, don't do it. Um, every time we drove through the local town that I, you know, like, what's the local town? Like, I grew up in the hut over in Silverstream. Every time I drove through Silverstream, and I would always be sitting in the back seat, I would lie down on the seat <laughs> until we got through. Is it safe? Are we through? And then, and then I'd sit back up again just in case anyone knows. I was so embarrassing. So embarrassing. Now, here's the thing. As much as we love the, you know, the love of God and everything that we've been singing about, we've got to catch what Paul is saying here. You see, there was potential for Paul to feel this way, to feel a bit embarrassed or a bit ashamed. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, actually, despite appearances, people, I am not ashamed to be seen in Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You see, what do we know about Paul? He left aside, he left behind cultural and religious elitism. I mean, this guy had made it, respected, you know. Uh, he was up there. And he left all of that behind to preach in the eyes of most that a failed, dead, messianic imposter was actually God's son and he was now king of heaven of earth, and earth and that he had been raised from the dead. Now, this whole idea of resurrection being raised from the dead, by the way, was a notion that simply did not fit within anyone's worldview at the time. It was either offensive or foolish. The idea of someone raised, I mean, Jews had an expectation of future resurrection, but their Messiah, the king, being crucified, forget it. And Greeks, in their platonic thought, why would you want to be raised from the dead? Once you died, you escaped the physical, which is bad, and you uh, inherit the spiritual, which is eternal and good. The idea of resurrection, ludicrous, foolishness. You see, this message about the gospel that Paul carried was counter to all expectations, all values, all cultural norms, and it ran against any idea or notion of success, power, and wisdom. It really was a lemon of a message. It was like Paul driving through town in a bright yellow van. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of it. I don't mind owning this vehicle and being seen in it. Why? Because in it is power. And this is where my analogy breaks down completely, right? <laughs> because this thing, there's no power in this thing, right? But there is power in the gospel message. Now, we need to hear this because at times, if we don't feel in our earthly, fleshly nature uh, a kind of a, a kickback or, or oh, you know, like an uncomfortable sort of ness with the gospel, then I want to ask the question, have we traded the power of a foolish gospel for the powerlessness of the wisdom of man? You know, is the gospel turned into self-promotion or success or, or prosperity, or things like that? Or does it still carry the sting and discomfort that, it, that Paul the Apostle carried with him as well? Let me give you one example of this, of where it should feel uncomfortable, like at times you should feel like lying down in the seat as you pass through town. The promotion of self and hyper-individualism that is worshipped today. Think about all that social media can feed into. You know, a projection of a successful life, a promotion of self. You know, Jesus comes along with a sledgehammer on that with the gospel and says, no, I am your king, I am your Lord. Die to yourself, lay down your own interest. It's not about promoting you. It's about serving other people and dying and making yourself nothing. It's like, do you want to be great? Then empty yourself, make yourself nothing. That kind of should feel like driving through town in a yellow van these days, all right? It is not comfortable. But who feels comfortable by that idea? Lay your life down. Forget about your interest and die for others. That's not a comfortable message, is it? It's very different than what the world would chase, all right? So 
Paul does not feel ashamed of the gospel because there is power. Let's look at that for a while. Romans uh, 1, I'll stop distracting you with that fan. For it is the power of God. Let's look at Paul's story, the Apostle Paul. He, this bloke, he went around getting a beating on every corner. Like he was a professional kind of, you know, victim of just getting stoned, abused, shipwrecked, flogged, you know, everything, you name it, he, he endured it. And on top of that, he went around actually sharing rather unimpressively a message that was scoffed at by most who heard it. I mean, half of the Corinthian correspondence is about them wanting flashier and more interesting and more exciting preachers to come and do the job. And uh, here's this guy. He's actually not that impressive. In fact, one local ruler dismissed him as being insane. Who is this guy, he said. But what happened? Well, people's lives started getting transformed. Paul began to move in great power. I mean, his snotty handkerchiefs are being sent to people that they might be healed. I mean, this is wonderful. You know, like whole towns and cities began to be impacted. Little communities started popping up around the place of, of believers. Genuine transformation. Uh, do you know whole economies were disrupted? Riots broke out. You know, this is kind of a big deal. And many converts to the Christian faith. You want to know one of the most prominent converts to the Christian faith? I hear you ask who? Well, who? Only the Roman Empire itself. You know, I mean, the whole thing becomes a Christian empire. It's like, it's like I love my, one of my favorite memes. It's like, well, that escalated quickly. You know, who was this guy going around getting flogged, unimpressive? Boom, the Roman Empire turns upside down. I mean, it's kind of a big deal. How did that happen? Because in the gospel is the power of God. Paul explains a little bit more in 1 Corinthians. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Some look for signs or others wisdom. But we preach, listen to this, we preach Christ crucified. We preach the opposite of what people accept. We preach a king who was murdered and killed. We preach glory humbled. You know, we preach like up, down, you know, failure, success, I mean, that joke. It's like we preach turn, what is it, turn left to go right or something like that. We, we preach the opposite of what people uh, expected. But to those who God has called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, this is what we preach. Now, what Paul and his companions and what hopefully I'm encouraging and stirring us to remember afresh this morning is that in the sharing of the gospel, the power of God is at work to bring about transformation. It's not the wisdom of the message itself. God's power by his spirit is at work. Little Natty as a four-year-old wasn't sort of contemplating the logic of the gospel. It was like God's power was at work, rested on that, and his life was transformed. No doubt as it is the case for many in this room. Many in this room. And so what they did is they went around town to town and just scattered the seed. Some fell on good soil, and from that an abundant harvest took place. You know, like it's, it's almost as if our church strategy bookshelf should just have one book with one page on it. It's like, share the gospel. There's power of God in it. I hate to simplify it, but that's kind of like the essence of what we're all about. The power of God at work in this. We are called to steward this. We are called to scatter it. Now here I saying, yep, thanks Matt, love your enthusiasm. You know, it's like challenging times at the moment though, isn't it? You know, it's like there's just people who are sick, we're tired, there's COVID, there's pressure, there's all sorts. It's like, can we get back to this evangelizing stuff when things get back to normal? I feel a challenge of the spirit. It's like, yeah, nah. Paul, uh, Paul said to Timothy, be prepared, preach the word, whether the time is favorable or not, whether you're in season or not. It's like whether you're in flu season or COVID season or not. You know, whether, whether things are going well or not. It's like, be prepared, preach the word, carry this message and steward it, and trust that in the foolishness of it, there is power and wisdom. Amen? I mean, this is what it's all about. It's like, come on. 
we can do this because it's like actually not our power, not our wisdom anyway. We are stewards of this message. We don't, when will normal be back again? You know, when will it ever be the right time? When is that going to happen? Now, I, I just have, you know, full disclosure. Has this been a priority for me lately? It's like, yeah, like I saw like eight people saved. I was filling up petrol on the way to church and it was amazing. It's like, no, no. But I'm feeling stirred by this. And my response to preaching to myself is, I just want to do one little thing a little bit more courageous than I did last week and just share a little bit more um, of it. And so it might be that, you know, hey, I'm putting my kids to bed. I'm going to, you know, share about Jesus with them. Read them a Bible story. It might be someone at work. Hey, look, you know, I'm a Christian. You know that. If you want to chat about that, happy to go for a coffee. I'm not going to, you know, cram it on you. But just so you know, I'm happy to talk about this. Might be friends or family or others that you've got a close relationship with. Take one little bold step. Be courageous. And trust God. Take him at his word that there is transformational power in this message. Hey, bro, thinking about you, how you doing this week? Just at church, hear about God's love. You know, whatever, like, if you want to chat, let me know. I don't know, whatever it looks like for you. Trust God that there is power in the message to bring about transformation. Amen? So, with our remaining time, what I want to do is run through Romans 8. And I want to preach to ourselves. Let's share, let's look at the gospel. You guys up for that? Everyone up for that? Okay, like 10 minutes because we don't really want to talk much longer than that anyway. But also this is how, it should be 10, 15 minute exercise, cup of coffee, you know, phone call or whatever. This is as accessible. And, and Romans 8 is just a brilliant chapter. It's one of the best chapters out there. And you can just walk through it and share something of the gospel message with yourself first and get stirred and also with whoever you're being bold with. Amen? Okay, Romans 8. Who loves this chapter? Favorite for anyone? It's quite dense though, isn't it? There's quite a lot going on in it. Paul was a pretty intelligent guy um, and there's a lot going on. So we'll just pick out a few phrases. So let's start in verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. <coughs> Who's being condemned? Why are they being condemned? What's that all about? Well, Romans chapter 2 speaks of a great day of judgment, a coming day of judgment where God, as a just judge, will enact his justice against all injustice and corruption and sin. In other words, think law court scene. God is a holy and righteous God. He is like a judge sitting in the law court, and you know he won't let injustice pass by. He will bring it to account. Now, this has got to be, at the same time, both a wonderful and terrifying thought, right? It's a wonderful and terrifying thought. First of all, it's wonderful because don't we all yearn for justice? Don't we all yearn for that when we see things happen in the world? I think about the reaction to certain things that have happened over the last couple of years. You know, riots in the street, millions of people massing. There is a God-given yearning for justice when we see these things happen. Think about the global response to the murder of George Floyd by a police officer. I mean, the injustice, the anger that rises is like, it's a God-given response. And, and this is a good thing because it's like, you know, all the stuff happening in the world, yes, God is a good God and he will bring it to account. But it's also a terrifying thing because if he was to do that right now today or immediately, it's a terrifying thought because we would all acknowledge that all of mankind actually stands in the dock guilty as charged. Paul makes that very argument. It's like you who would preach against stealing, like do you steal? You who feel a, a need for justice, if God was to pass justice on you, would you stand? And Paul's response is no, actually we are all guilty as charged. That's the humbling, sober first couple of chapters of, 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 of Romans. But the good news, because that's what gospel means, right, is that God has made a way through faith in Jesus, through his death and resurrection, to be declared righteous, to be declared in the right, to be declared at peace with God. But here's the cool thing. You can be confident now, 2022, 
of the decision that will be made in the future in that coming day. You can be, you can be assured that in the future you will be declared righteous. And you can, be, you can be confident of that now. There is now, now, present tense, no condemnation. There's no condemnation. But how does that take place? How does that even work? Well, we know this stuff, but it's just good to be reminded, isn't it? That's why we take communion. It's simple. It's a simple meal with profound truth. This is why we go back to this stuff. It's like we stir our hearts. This is what it's all about. God sent his son. God sent his son, this just judge that will pass judgment on everything. Just think about that. Would you send your kid? It's like God did. He sent his son. He sent his son in the brokenness of humanity to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. So actually where it says there is no condemnation, there is condemnation, but of sin in the body of Christ in your place. This is good stuff. This is what it's all about. Now, sin here is not just talking about like the bad list of stuff of all the things that you've done that Jesus had to deal with. It includes that. But more than that, it's the, it's the corrupting, polluting, staining evil powers behind those, those things. It's like, it's like Satan and it's the fall and it's death and it's decay. And the good news about the cross is not just that he wiped your individual slate clean. But he put those powers to shame. Colossians 2. He disarmed them. There's no sting in them anymore. He made a public spectacle of them. He triumphed over them by the cross. We know this stuff, but it's just good to reflect on it and be like, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. God, you sent your son. You died for me. And you've defeated sin on the cross. Thank you. I am in the right. I, have, I am at peace with God. I am at peace with God. Now, the cool thing is, there's more. God introduces an entirely new way to be human. And that is to live in harmony with our Creator. To walk in a more genuine uh, humanity. And do you know what that is? It's to be filled with the Spirit. Of course we're a Spirit-filled people. Of course, Ezekiel says, I will give you a new heart and put a new Spirit in you. So just think about this. You went from being condemned to having the creator of the universe dwell in your heart by his spirit. Isn't that kind of a cool thought? You can just whisper the smallest thing in your heart and the creator of the universe is present with you, listening to you. He's with you by his spirit. I think it's a beautiful thought. The Holy Spirit is with us. And now we can walk in a new way in harmony with him. But wait, there's more. All right? Those who are led in this way are children of God. By him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Listen to this. As Christians, we step out of the law court and into the loving embrace of a heavenly father. We need to understand this. We need to discover that this judge, yes, while he is righteous and just and fair, and it is a terrifying thought to be judged by him, actually he is also a warm and loving father, and he cares for you deeply. Do you know that? He cares for you deeply. He dotes over you. He adores you. I mean, you guys have seen me with my kids sometimes. I love them. There's nothing compared to what the father thinks about you. When you pop into his mind, warmth, affection, love boils up in his heart for you. Do you know that? You exist as a beloved child of God. Do we know that? The Holy Spirit stirs it in our heart. This is the case. This is the case. Any Christian who says, hey, look, I'm just a forgiven sinner, and that's all I'll ever be, it's... No, you're adopted, you're loved, you are a beloved child. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Anyone, you know, like, anyone in line for, like, massive inheritance, you know? You know, like, going to inherit, like, I don't know, a 
a giant mansion or something like that. Nothing. Pfft, not impressed. You know? Going to inherit Elon Musk's wealth when he dies. Pfft, nothing. Nothing compared to what you have in store for you as a child. Not only are you a child, you have an inheritance. You have an inheritance. And what is your inheritance? Anyone know? I'll tell you what it is. And the short answer is glory. It's glory. I've been following about the new James Webb telescope. Anyone kind of geeking out on that at the moment as well? This new telescope that can see deeper and further and farther and, and glorious. It's like, it's a parody of the glory that you will inherit as a child of God. You know, all the things that it's unlocking. Paul forecasts glory in two ways. First of all, you will have a glorious resurrected body. All right? Better news for some of us than others. All right? And secondly, you will dwell in a glorious renewed creation. New heavens and a new earth. This is part of the glory that you will inherit. And in those two, so that with those two things, the main thing is that you will dwell with God forever. No more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering, no more, no more COVID. Wouldn't that be nice? No more, don't use that word, the C word. You know, it's like no more glory, eternal glory. So Paul can say, uh, and i uh, flick through a few quick verses here, we wait eagerly for, our redemption, for the redemption of our bodies. Uh, elsewhere, Paul says, we will be certainly united with, a, with him in a resurrection like his. This is Pauline speak for not like just escaping to heaven when we die, but actually a renewed, physical, embodied, imperishable, eternal life. And I'm for one looking forward to that. And, actually, and, and the second verse there, which is one of my favorite in all of the Bible, uh, is that creation itself, you know, the world, the cosmos, the star, everything, all of that is waiting eagerly. Do you know what it's waiting eagerly for? The revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Because this verse makes very clear that when they enter their glory, when God's children are glorified and inherit their inheritance, uh, creation itself will be liberated and set free. It's like your inheritance as a child of God is a renewed and stored creation, and it's waiting eagerly for that day. This is a wonderful truth. This is our future hope with God forever. Glory. That's what we yearn for in our hearts, is it? Glory. That's our future hope. But wait, there's more. In this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There is a patient waiting for this glory, isn't there? And here you ask, are we waiting even through suffering? Well, actually, especially through suffering. Paul says it almost bl quite bluntly, we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. And this is the kind of sharp edge of the gospel. Actually, if you're signing up to follow Jesus, it's like this is part of what you are called to walk through. Glory, yes, but actually there's trials, there's hardships, there's things that are not easy. You're going to drive through town in a yellow van. It's like, this is what we are called to. And is that comfortable? No. Is it painful? Yes. Of course it is. I mean, Paul describes this whole ordeal as one of the most painful moments in human experience that one can ever go through. Oh, sorry, I got my slides mixed up. No, it's not driving, it's not driving that van. It's, it's actually childbirth. It's childbirth. Just think about that, that image. Pain and suffering. It's not to be glib about that. You know, it's gut-wrenching. We've, we've, we've all faced things in our life. Loss, pain, suffering. What do we do with this? I thought God was a good and loving God and we're, in, we're going to inherit all this glory. Well, the first thing that we discover is that he is not absent in all of this. Creation groans. His people groaned. You know how else is groaning? 
God by his spirit. That's the message of the gospel, that he entered into the brokenness. And that's the message that we can take to those around us. Yes, you're hurting, but God is present in that pain. I mean, how do I talk to someone at work whose sister is trying to commit suicide right now? You know? God is present with you in this. He loves you. He is not going to abandon you. He knows the pain. He, he took it on the cross. It is an empathetic and present God. That is the gospel that we carry because there's a hurting world out there. He is present, and we take comfort in that. We also weigh up the glory that is to be revealed. So elsewhere it says, I don't consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. And obviously that's a, a, a passage that needs to be used in wisdom. You know, if someone's in the thick of hurting, you might just not throw that at them. Of course not. But it's like, actually, there is glory that is coming up that is, even in the most painful of hurts, there's nothing, can, you know, the glory will outweigh that as well. So Paul finishes, finishes his chapter, and I'll finish shortly as well. I consider, uh, sorry, that's what I just said. Um, I, can, I am convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, even through all of this. We can be assured. So I said 10 minutes. It might have been more like 15, sorry. But um, that's something of the gospel message that we carry. It's just a quick skip through Romans 8. God is a just judge. But in Christ there is no condemnation. And, and through Jesus' death and resurrection, you are declared righteous now in advance of that day. He has given you of his Holy Spirit. What a wonderful truth. You are adopted as a loving child. As royalty, you are in line for a great inheritance. But now, it's patience, even suffering, and it's hope. But we walk this way assured of his love for us. That is just something of the gospel in Romans 8. And I would encourage you to refresh yourself, refresh myself in these truths. And my challenge is just take one small courageous step this week to share the love of God with, with somebody in this gospel, in this gospel message. Because as the Bible makes clear, you, 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 are Christ's ambassadors. And it's as if this week God would be making his appeal through you. Through you. Amen? Let's stand. Father, we first want to thank you that you've been at work in our life. You've, you've, we're here because you've touched our lives. We've, we want to re we've responded to the gospel, perhaps. We've, 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 we've wanted to follow you, and our lives have been transformed. Father God, I pray in all the season that we're in and everything that's going on, Lord, help us to keep this front and center, that you died for us, that you love us, and that you are calling us to, to carry this message. And Father God, I pray by your Spirit you would both encourage us this week, refresh us in this truth, and also stir us and challenge us to share it with somebody, to, to, to share the love of God and, and all wisdom and, and appropriateness and care, Lord, this week, to, to, to be one who is an ambassador for you. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you just move across this room. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would implant a fresh fresh sense of sort of urgency for the love of God to be made known in those, in those lives around us. In Jesus' name. And we say we love you. We love you, Lord. And, we, you know, we want to do this because, you know, you first reached into our life and transformed us. And, Father, I pray for anyone who has not responded to this message, whether they're in this room or not. And I pray, Lord, open the eyes of their hearts that they might see your beauty they might behold your glory. They might that their lives might be touched and transformed, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the power of God will be, be present in their lives to bring transformation. In Jesus' name. Bring us into a season, Lord, of, 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 
of young spiritual babies being born. Bring us into a season, Lord, of fruitfulness. Bring us into a season of sharing the gospel and seeing fruit, Lord. I pray for baptisms. I pray for new births. I pray for disciple groups to, 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 to pop up because we've got new Christians around the place. I pray for alpha groups, Lord. I pray for passion and zeal and grace to do all this with the limited energy and, and our level, energy levels that we have at the moment, Lord. Breathe on this church, Lord, and daily add, daily add to those who are being saved. Do it, Lord. We pray for our kids, Lord. Save them and make them disciples of Christ. I pray that for our kids. I pray that for our neighbours, our work colleagues, Lord. Use us to reach into this life because it's like, it's all going to be done soon and we want what's done for you to last, Lord. We want, we want, we want people to be impacted by the gospel. We do, Lord. We're doing it all for you. Romans 1.1, Lord, set us apart for the gospel of, of Christ. Do it, Lord. In Jesus' name, stir our hearts and breathe on us, we pray.